Welcome to The Coolidge Way. We've spoken a great deal about Calvin Coolidge's era and his views on the issues of his day, and even wondered what Coolidge might think about contemporary public policy issues. Over the past two episodes, we've discussed President Coolidge's biography. Today, we'll dive into a topic from his presidency that couldn't be more contemporary, budget and taxes. Even as we record this podcast, Congress and the president are contemplating expanding federal spending and changing tax rates. In this episode, we'll show how Coolidge dealt with the very same challenge in the period he served as chief executive, 1923 to 29. We even have a star guest, noted economic commentator Steve Forbes. Steve made a name for himself back in the 1990s when he ran for Coolidge's old job, the U.S. presidency, by focusing on taxes and budget. A lot of us remember Steve's tax campaigns, but even those who don't share his views recognize him as one of the most astute economic observers out there. Mr. Forbes has traveled to Plymouth Notch to speak at the Coolidge Summer Gala, including one year where he and his daughter made it to the presidential birthplace by bicycle. The Forbes Take is coming up on The Coolidge Way. I'm Jim Douglas, four-term governor of Vermont and big fan of our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge was a thoughtful man. Taking his perspective on governmental do's and don'ts, we evaluate today's important challenges. And we'll always ask, what would Coolidge do? This is The Coolidge Way, proudly presented by the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Before we get into today's topic and bring in Steve Forbes, let's roll out our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz. Here's the question. Coolidge struggled to cut taxes. The top tax rate was 58% for the year Coolidge took office. To what level did Coolidge and Congress manage to bring the top tax rate down in their 1926 reform? For comparison, here's a hint. In modern times, Ronald Reagan and Congress cut the top rate down to 28%. Well, think about that top tax rate question, and we'll have the answer at the end of the episode. I also want to take a moment to let you know how you can get in touch with us. Send us your thoughts on this episode at coolidgefoundation.org slash the Coolidge Way, or by visiting our social pages on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to see your comments and any ideas you have for future episode topics. Our previous episode concluded in August 1923 with stunning news for a vice president who happened to be on vacation at his father's house. The president was dead. Just hours after the news was delivered that Warren Harding had died, Coolidge's own father swore the new president in. The simple ceremony, conducted in the wee hours of the night by kerosene light at the Coolidge home in Plymouth, Vermont, recalled Abe Lincoln. The Homestead inaugural also symbolized the kind of simple presidency that Coolidge would offer America. And Coolidge felt ready. I think I can swing it, he said. But what was it that this humble new president wanted to swing? The priority was ensuring America could continue to grow. To Coolidge, that meant ensuring that the environment was friendly to the people who can give Americans what they needed most of all, jobs. The work of ensuring a job-creating economy started with Andrew Mellon, Coolidge's Treasury Secretary. Under Harding, Mellon, already at Treasury, had initiated a series of tax cuts. Coolidge now promised Mellon that he would put presidential muscle behind the tax cut campaign. What kind of verbiage did President Coolidge use to make sure people knew he was serious? Serious rhetoric. For example, at one point Coolidge told Americans that I will bend my energies to a tax and budget program. The presidency isn't merely leadership. The presidency is also delegation and partnership. As we'll hear today, Coolidge partnered with a number of cabinet officers and agency heads. One was the Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon. The quiet Coolidge and the even quieter Mellon made an odd pair. How can two silent guys write great plans and usher them through Congress? Those who observed this odd couple joked that Mellon and Coolidge conversed in pauses. Yet for two silent guys, Coolidge and Mellon did come up with a complex plan and executed it. Why the urgency? 
In the course of World War I, and through great expenditure in lives and federal monies, the United States had secured a new lead in the world economy, surpassing the British Empire. But sustaining that first-place spot depended on our relative competitiveness in the world. If America ran big deficits and levied high taxes, it would drive business away. Money and gold would flee to Britain, and America would slip back. There was also a promise to voters to keep. Back in 1920, Harding and Coolidge had committed to pulling the federal government out of Americans' lives, resetting it back to old pre-war norms. They also wanted to reverse some of the expansionary trends that had begun even before World War I. In fact, the campaign logo Harding and Coolidge chose was normalcy. Now let's bring in our special guest, Steve Forbes. First, let's set the stage. What was the context for the Harding-Coolidge promise? What had become so abnormal about American economic policy and the size of government? Well, thank you very much, uh, Governor. Good, good to be with you. Uh, the background goes to uh, what happened in 1913. The 16th Amendment of the Constitution was passed that allowed the U.S. to uh, impose an income tax. We'd had an income tax during the Civil War as an emergency measure. It was uh, taken off after the war. Uh, People, reformers, have brought back the income tax in the 1890s, but the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional, hence the need for a constitutional amendment. The reformers who pushed the income tax thought it was a much fairer way to raise revenue as a primary source of uh, revenue for the government than the tariff. Tariff is equivalent to a sales tax on imports. And the reformers and the progressives said that that was unfair because it hit lower income people harder than higher income people. Uh, You had to spend a certain amount of your income on the necessities of life. Uh, For lower income people, obviously, that was a greater percentage of their income than for those who had more resources. So the feeling was that actually the income tax was a redistribution mechanism. It would uh, take money, uh, more money from those who had the resources, their reasoning went, take less from uh, working people, And so they thought tariffs would come down as the income tax was uh, put in. So the income tax was uh, enacted in 1913 after the amendment passed. The highest rate was 7%. And then came uh, the advent of World War I. And as we know, wars, especially major wars, are huge, voracious consumers of, of resources, not just human lives, but resources in terms of money. And so the income tax soon during World War I had a rate not of 7%, but of 77%. And uh, the idea was, gee, if you raise the rate, you'll get more revenue. But actually, we started to see a phenomenon that Coolidge recognized, that Ronald Reagan recognized, that John Kennedy recognized when he was president. So what happened in the 1920s as a result of those high tax rates? And that is when rates reached certain high levels, Guess what happens? People find ways not to, uh, to get around those extremely high confiscatory levels. So just one little factoid, between 1915 and 1918, uh, the top income earners in this country, uh, the number of tax returns, income tax returns, fell by half between 1915 and 1918 when the rate went from 7% to 77%. And so uh, the revenue anticipation wasn't there. After the war, World War I, uh, the Wilson administration did recognize that uh, 77% rates were counterproductive, but they were very timid about doing anything about it. They only reduced the rate to 73. So here you have the uh, Harding-Coolidge administration coming in in 1921. Well, Steve, fulfilling the Harding-Coolidge promise meant reducing the size of government and the rate of tax. Now, the executive branch didn't have the power to get rid of the entire federal government, but Coolidge could surely cut the federal government back. The president and Treasury Secretary Mellon, together, likewise, didn't have the power to end the income tax, but they could talk Congress into lowering the income tax rate down from that prohibitive level. So how do you accomplish that? Uh, They cut spending, slashed spending almost in half. They took off wartime controls. Uh, people don't remember, but the telephone uh, companies, what we call telecommunication companies today, they were nationalized by the government during World War I, as were the railroads. Uh, those measures were rescinded. 
So spending was slashed and taxes were cut. Andrew Mellon became the first, uh, became the secretary of the treasury under Harding and then uh, Calvin Coolidge. Uh, Mellon was a formidable industrialist from Pittsburgh, had interest in steel and oil and other industries. He'd probably rank in the top five of the Forbes 400 if we had it back in those days. But Mellon recognized, of just from own personal experience, that very high tax rates were counterproductive. It uh, funneled your energies from being productive and starting new and growing enterprises to avoiding the tax collector. So you had various ways to uh, get around the tax, whether it was buying municipal bonds, setting up a personal, uh, your own personal corporation, individual corporation, the various devices uh, used to get around it. So uh, uh, Mellon pushed for cutting those confiscatory rates. Uh, they had some success. Uh, they cut the top rate from 73% down to 58%, uh, increased the exemptions, and did something that sounds like a, a new tax, but actually uh, was the opposite, was the first capital gains tax. Up until uh, that Revenue Act, Governor, the capital gains was considered ordinary income. Oh, we talk about a dampener of uh, uh, animal spirits in the, in the business world. Imagine paying a 73% capital gains tax. So uh, they put one in at a statutory rate of, I think, about 12.5%, started to hack away at the uh, excess profits taxes from the war. So Mellon was disappointed by the scope of it, but it certainly got the economic ball rolling. The U.S. came out of that depression very quickly, and within a couple of years, we were at virtual full employment. But Calvin Coolidge came in. And he and Mellon were of one mind. And that is, you know, the Republicans, it's, it's human nature. See, they've done this nice tax cut. The economy is beginning to hum again. Tendency, it would be to rest on your oars. Well, Coolidge and, uh, and Coolidge and Mellon were having none of that. So they pushed for, even though Coolidge did not have his own electoral mandate yet, they did push through a Revenue Act of uh, 1924. Uh, they cut the top rate from 58 to 46 percent. Again, uh, expanded the number of tax brackets so it would hit people uh, less. Where did Coolidge and Mellon compromise, and how did they stage their tax cuts? But they did put in a death tax, uh, uh, an inheritance tax of 40 percent, but it only hit people with very, very uh, high estates. But they still put it in, and they put in a gift tax. So uh, again, they were disappointed by the scope of it. But after Coolidge won a resounding re-election in 1924 in a hard-fought three-way uh, race, we well, had the Democrat, you had Coolidge as the Republican, but you also had Robert La Follette as the progressive candidate, very strong candidate, who uh, got 18% of the vote, around 18% of the vote. So Coolidge, even though it was a three-way race, he won a majority. The Republicans were firmly in control of Congress. And finally, uh, Mellon and Coolidge got the kind of a Revenue Act, Tax Cut Act that they wanted. And so they cut the top rate from 46 down to 25, slashed excise taxes, got rid of the death tax, got rid of the gift tax. So uh, they, and, and they did a lot of good things. Now, it's important to realize it was not just income tax, but excise taxes, as you know, are sales taxes on particular items uh, like uh, movie tickets or lubricant or oil. Uh, the things, the uh, daily things you buy, candy bars and the like. And so they cut those taxes. So uh, in effect, they're cutting the cost of living. And even though they had cut the, even though starting with uh, Harding, uh, they cut the top rate from 73% down to 25%. Well, in modern times, economists emphasize efficiency when they argue for tax cuts. They figure that lower rates foster more business activity. Coolidge and Mellon thought about efficiency too. They theorized that increased commerce might lead to higher tax revenue than was expected for the federal government. So Coolidge and Mellon wanted to try out this experiment. Mellon called it scientific taxation. Now, Steve, what were the results of Coolidge's and Mellon's experiment with scientific taxation? Even though they did that, between 1923 and 1927, the amount of income tax, first the receipts went up, not down. Even though the 26th Revenue Act was made retroactive, so uh, you got uh, the tax cut in 1925, 
and not just having to wait to 26 or 2019, 20, 27. So you got a nice bonus there. Usually they only make tax increases retroactive, but they made the tax cuts retroactive. So Coolidge managed eventually to get the top rates down low. But what about the wealthy? Did they pay less in taxes when the top rates were cut? That would be intuitive. The top income earners, who uh, in 1923, the, the, the top people paid 28% of the federal income tax. By 1927, even though the tax rates had been cut by almost two-thirds, they were paying 50% of the tax receipts collected, and the amount of money collected went up, not down. So by creating this benign environment, uh, Coolidge, uh, working with closely with Andrew Mellon, uh, brought about a very, very conducive environment for innovation. And you look at the 1920s, and there w- it was a fantastic decade. People think of it as flappers and stuff like that, Great Gatsby. It was actually an extraordinarily innovative decade. But experiments and utility weren't all Coolidge was thinking about. To Coolidge, tax reductions were more than just prudent or useful. Tax reductions were morally necessary. Taxing at rates of 50% or 40% took away too much of a person's work. Taking too much of someone's property was, as Coolidge put it, legalized larceny. Here's Coolidge living history performer Tracy Messer, quoting from a 1925 speech. I favor the policy of economy, not because I wish to save money, but because I wish to save people. The men and women of this country who toil are the ones who bear the cost of the government. Every dollar that we carelessly waste means that their life will be so much the more meager. Every dollar that we prudently save means that their life will be so much the more abundant. Where did all these ideas in Coolidge's brain come from? not just from Mellon and his experience in steel or finance, but also from the president's own boyhood experiences in rural Vermont, my home state. The kind of New England farmers Coolidge grew up among couldn't afford waste. As Coolidge recalled, My fundamental idea of both private and public businesses came first from my father. He had the strong New England trait of great repugnance at seeing anything wasted. He was a generous and charitable man, but he regarded waste as a moral wrong. In fact, Coolidge chose humble New England images when he talked about the mighty federal household. His father ran a cheese cooperative in Plymouth. You can still visit the updated version of the cheese factory today, where you can buy Plymouth artisan cheese and also take home some garlic peppercorn cheese. Anyhow, Coolidge likened his budget cuts to cheese pairing. What strikes me as someone who dealt a lot with budgets is that to get those budget and tax reductions required incredible discipline and determination. Coolidge displayed that determination by making nearly everything in his life about budget and taxes, right down to the White House pets. At one point, the mayor of Johannesburg sent Coolidge twin lion cubs. Instead of traditional White House pet names like Bo, Barney, or Major, Coolidge named his cubs Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. To deliver on the budget side, Coolidge teamed up with another partner, Herbert Mayhew Lord, director of the newly created Bureau of the Budget. With Mellon, Coolidge crafted a set of laws that cut taxes in half. With General Lord, Coolidge achieved the federal spending reductions. How did Coolidge and Budget Director Lord work? Well, as I myself learned, saying no to people who come into your office is only possible if you're well prepared for the meeting. So Coolidge and Budget Director Lord scheduled their own prep sessions before cabinet meetings. Therefore, when the time came, they were ready to say no. Together, Coolidge and Lord managed to reduce the national debt and cut the federal budget. The change in mindset the two men sought was sweeping yet no detail escaped their attention. You can imagine Coolidge and Lord together, head-to-head, marking cuts with an accountant's pencil. Coolidge and Lord found savings of $50,000 per year on the fabric for post office bags. The red tape used to wrap federal paperwork was replaced by a cheaper white string. Cutting red tape by cutting red tape from the budget. Now, that's symbolic. Let's pause for a minute. 
You might hear lawmakers today talk about budget cuts, but what those lawmakers often mean by cuts is really reductions in increases. In Harding's and then Coolidge's time, we're talking about actually cutting the budget, which was hard to do as the population of the 1920s was growing. As Coolidge and General Lord worked to foster a culture of frugality throughout the federal government, Coolidge persisted in setting an example in his personal life. The president urged the White House housekeeper, a real institution named Elizabeth Jaffray, to cut back on her extravagant spending. Better, Coolidge reasoned, for Mrs. Jaffray to shop at the supermarket, where economies of scale resulted in lower prices. Coolidge understood that he could only achieve the political changes he wanted if he lived the same changes in his private life. Well, Steve Forbes, why was it so important to Coolidge to combine tax and budget reductions? Yeah, when you say budget and you say balancing the budget, people yawn and think, oh, you're a crimped person uh, and you're going to hurt people and uh, you have a sort of a Scrooge-like attitude towards the world. And uh, it's quite the opposite. When you are restrained in government spending, you, uh, you give, leave more resources in the hands of the people. Government does not create resources. Government seizes resources, whether through taxes or through borrowing or through the stealth tax of inflation. And then they uh, redistribute or spend them, those resources. But people create the resources. And Coolidge recognized uh, profoundly that when you left a maximum amount of resources in the hands of free people, by golly, those resources proliferate and people do better, raises uh, real wages rise up, the standard of living improves, as we saw in the 1920s, and uh, people are uh, better off. So uh, the idea that when government spends, that shows you have a heart. No, it shows you are uh, ignorant of what enables people to have a better future. And by the way, not, the 20s was such a, a productive decade that uh, if we hadn't had the Great Depression, which uh, then was followed with World War II, the interstate highway program of the 1950s would have taken place in the 1930s. There was already thought being given to having a national highway system, a national highway grid, unlike railroads. Uh, you could not go from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, on uh, on a railroad, you have to keep changing in Chicago and elsewhere to get another go to another station, get another railroad to get to where you ultimately wanted to go. So they wanted a more efficient uh, highway system, a national highway system, and so uh, we would have had it uh, the, in the 30s instead of with uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who began the interstate highway program in the mid 1950s. So America might have advanced faster, but going back to our subject. As the 1920s progressed, Americans, including working Americans, profited. The Roaring Twenties, as the era is known today, were not fake news. That decade proved to be one of the most prosperous periods in American history. New inventions came along at a rate they still study at Harvard Business School. Many hallmarks of modern life began to become commonplace during this period. Home appliances to make fast work of strenuous chores. Ford Model A's. Indoor plumbing. Electricity and the radio. Because of the widespread productivity gains throughout the economy, workers could take Saturdays off, then a new idea, but something we take for granted today. Well, Steve Forbes, anything else to add to your take on the Coolidge administration and growth? Do you think smaller government fostered growth? It did indeed, because by freeing up resources, uh, there are uh, people who uh, could use those resources productively could have a chance to uh, do just that. And so you, you look at all the things that flourished in the 1920s, the automobile. Yes, we'd had a lot of automobile sales before the 20s, but sales really took off as middle-income people could easily buy automobiles. Uh, They're being made cheaper and cheaper. Uh, this led to the greatest road-building program since the days of the Roman Empire. Uh, gasoline stations by the tens of thousands sprung up from private investment. And this is in contrast to, say, what the Biden administration wants to do now in spending tens of billions of dollars to have electric recharging stations for electronic vehicles. Well, if the people really wanted electronic vehicles, uh, private uh, investors and entrepreneurs would create it and create it very efficiently and abundantly, just as was done with gasoline stations <laughs> really getting underway in the 20s. 
It also had electricity coming into its own. Electricity obviously had been around for a, a couple uh, for years uh, when Edison uh, showed what, how you could uh, have electric uh, lighting and the like. But it wasn't until the 20s that it really took off, often with uh, innovations. It takes a 20-year period when uh, people really begin to get the knack of it and when it becomes very, very widespread. So in the 20s, you had more uh, homes get, having electricity. You also had millions of homes getting telephones for the first time, indoor plumbing for the first time. Today, we think of the arrival of the Internet as a shift that changes everything. You've described how the arrival of electricity transformed the country in a very similar way. You saw the rise of labor-saving devices, uh, whether it was uh, vacuum cleaners, electric vacuum cleaners, electric irons, uh, refrigerators, uh, stoves, and also one of the great inventions of all time, the washing machine. Uh, People should go go online once in a while or sometime and look up... uh, what, how uh, clothes were washed before the advent of the washing machine. Uh, it wrecked the hands. It was a very, very tough thing. And now you could just plop the clothes in a washing machine and swoosh it would be done without wrecking your hands. And so what this d- did was free up time for women who were in the homes. They had more free time, more independence. This led to the rise of beauty parlors and the like. Women uh, got the right to vote after World War I. So it was a time where, uh, for millions of women, was the first taste of liberation. Obviously, a lot more had to be done, but it was the beginnings of uh, having uh, rights for women become a reality, uh, thanks to uh, not only the right to vote, but also these uh, devices that enabled them to have more control over their time and spend time on uh, more uh, fruitful and uh, productive things. And so... uh, you look at the rise of movie theaters. Yes, we had movies before uh, of the 20s, but they really boomed in the 20s. Every town in the country had its own movie theater. Uh, first silent films and then uh, sound in the, uh, at the end of the decade. Uh, you had the uh, rise of high tech in terms of radio. Today, we think radio, yawn, big deal. But the idea of being able to transport a human voice over the air without a wire was just absolutely stunning to people. First radio station came out of Pittsburgh uh, around 1920-21, and uh, people wondered, what do we use this for? Do we use it as a, a community bulletin board? Well, you know, programming was devised, and uh, we had the networks rise up. So you had the advent of radio, and you saw the first uh, breakthroughs on television in the 1920s. So and and then uh, you had another big thing that uh, impacted agriculture, and that it was the uh, invention and the proliferation of the tractor. Uh, before the advent of the tractor, you had to set aside literally tens of millions of acres to grow forage for food animals. Now with the tractor, all that land was freed up. You could use it for uh, housing. You could use it to grow more food or uh, just for uh, nice, uh, nice uh, acreage to look at. You talk today about the changes in tax rates during the 1920s. At other points in our history, you've been a major proponent of a flat tax, a single rate for all taxpayers. Tell us what the advantages of that would be, and do you think it's something that Calvin Coolidge would have liked? I think Calvin Coolidge would have loved the flat tax. I think he would have seen it not just as an economic measure, but as uh, something that is moral. What is not fully recognized about Coolidge was he approached uh, how he lived. He approached public life with a sense of morality, not in the sense of uh, saying, do this, don't do that, but in a profounder sense of uh, trying to do what is right and uh, not uh, being uh, tyrannical towards people. And so uh, he saw a moral dimension of doing right in the public sector. And uh, the flat tax is an example of that. As you know, today, the Federal Income Tax Code and all of its attendant rules and regulations come to a 10 million words and rising. Nobody knows what's in it. We know that it's a corrupt cesspool. Uh, they keep cluttering the code. Oh, we're going to do good with this credit or that credit or this thing or that thing. And uh, it, uh, nobody has faith in it. A lot of people uh, now don't even pay income tax because uh, uh, they've raised, thankfully, the exemptions enough. But the code uh, requires at least uh, 6 billion hours a year, according to the IRS, 6 billion hours a year to fill out tax forms. 
And then uh, experts tell us that it takes over $200 billion a year. Some say it's as much as $400 billion that people spend in money and time filling out tax forms, everything from your quarterly estimates and everything else uh, you, you, you do. And so here's go back 20 years, take over 100 billion hours of time, literally trillions of dollars to comply with, to try to cope with this uh, beast. And imagine if all those resources instead had gone to new products, new services, new medical devices, new uh, cures for diseases, how much better off we'd all be having all that brain power going for something productive instead of coping with an incomprehensible monstrosity. So I think Coolidge would have glommed onto it right away, have a single rate. You'd have generous exemptions for adults and for kids. Under the plan I had, your first family, family of four, your first $52,800 of salary would be free of federal income tax. No tax on your savings. And above the 52800 level, you pay only 17 cents on the dollar. And this is not theory. Uh, over 30 countries have uh, flat taxes of one sort or another, and they've worked very well. Thank you very much. In other words, you see the flat tax, or at least a flatter tax, as not a new, untested idea, but something that has long been tried in one way or another. So this is not theory. This is real world. I think Coolidge would have recognized, again, bring resources up. Government ends up collecting more because you have a more prosperous economy. But letting people have more of their own resources the more, and not punishing them for creating uh, more businesses, more jobs, doing the things that you like to do, uh, makes for a happier society instead of uh, the, the, what, what we go through today. And I think he also would have liked the reform of uh, the payroll tax, which is a uh, you know, you pay that on dollar one. I think you'd have been interested in reform there, where uh, uh, you, I, I, as a matter of fact, if Coolidge had been president in the 30s and we wanted Social Security, I think he would have done it through the private sector, where, like with your IRAs or your 401ks, you would have a private company do it. Uh, government may set the rules on what you can and cannot do, but uh, we would have had a much healthier system. Uh, the, if Coolidge had done it, rather than uh, what uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt did. Well, today, Steve, we have a rapidly escalating federal debt. Didn't Coolidge also confront a debt problem? Well, as you know, uh, the U.S. faced a huge national debt after World War I, not as great as World War II because we weren't in the First World War for the length and period that we were in World War II, but it was still sizable, huge increase. And the amazing thing is, under uh, Harding started, but Coolidge really pushed it by having uh, careful budgeting and by these uh, tax cuts that ended up having the rich pay more and uh, the economy blossoming and being so innovative and productive. The national debt by the end of Coolidge's term in office had been reduced by about a third. How does the debt policy of Coolidge contrast with policy advanced by Washington today? The debt is ballooning, not because of a national war. Uh, it was ballooning even before the COVID-19 crisis. Everyone understands uh, because of that crisis, the, uh, the pandemic, that obviously you're going to uh, have a situation where if you shut the economy down, you're going to have to spend a boatload of money for emergency measures to uh, try to keep some businesses alive and people uh, uh, being able to uh, survive when suddenly all revenue is shut off for a period of time. But uh, so the crisis is now over, and yet this administration is proposing spending even greater than what we did during the COVID crisis itself. And uh, for what purpose? We see that uh, it's uh, trying to create entitlements to make people dependent on government, getting benefits without a work requirement, uh, paying, uh, topping, uh, giving bonuses on unemployment. Which uh, so people will make more by not working than by seeking a job, which is why we have the crazy situation today where we have 8 million, over 8 million job openings. Well, let's hope things turn around. And it's great to chat with someone who's so knowledgeable about America's fiscal policy and also a great fan of number 30, as we call him, President Calvin Coolidge. 
Steve Forbes, thank you for taking the time to explain key features of America's economy in the 1920s and their relevance today. And thanks also for your service as a trustee of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. We really appreciate your being with us. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, Governor, and uh, maybe uh, you should, uh, even though you've uh, earned a great retirement, maybe you should uh, get back into public service again and uh, revive, help revive the Coolidge spirit. We, 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 we need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've told Vermonters that I'll run for office again right after my divorce, and I'm not planning on that. <laughs> I know the same pressures. <laughs> really, what we've heard today is the Coolidge legacy. Coolidge's economy was a genuinely strong one. By the end of the 1920s, America had secured its place as the world's financial capital. Franklin Roosevelt didn't follow Coolidge's philosophy in the Great Depression, but later presidents did, especially Ronald Reagan who launched his own round of tax cuts on the Coolidge model. Democrats have also replicated the Coolidge move. At the end of the 1990s, for example, President Bill Clinton and Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin joined Congress in cutting the capital gains tax rate. Taxes and budgets are controversial. We know this discussion can continue, and we'll do what we can at the Coolidge Foundation to foster tax debate, presenting both sides of the argument just as we do with our students in the Coolidge community. This year, for example, at the Coolidge Cup debate tournament, our debaters focused on these tough questions, specifically whether the wealthy should pay more taxes. For a discussion of more key issues from the Coolidge presidency, stay tuned for our next episode, which will conclude our biographical series on Silent Cal. The Coolidge Way is a production of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, with offices in both Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and Washington, D.C. Special thanks to our guest, Steve Forbes, for his contributions to this episode, as well as Coolidge Living History performer, Tracy Messer. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments on this episode, or any other, please don't hesitate to send me a note at coolidgefoundation.org slash the Coolidge Way, or on one of our social pages. Earlier in this episode, our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz asked you this question. What was the top tax rate of Coolidge's final reform? The answer is 25%. I wonder if we'll ever see that again. I'm former Vermont Governor Jim Douglas. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us for another episode of The Coolidge Way, 